Well, welcome back. It has been seven weeks since restrictions were lifted in Oklahoma City, and this is our first press conference since that day. I said at that time that you would hear from me if any of the major data points spiked upward, and unfortunately that is why we are here today. I've spent the last several days working with our public health officials to answer some important questions about the state of our pandemic in Oklahoma City, and I can share that information now. To recap, in March, April, and May, we faced an exponentially growing outbreak, and we took major collective action as a community, we flattened the curve, and we avoided becoming a hot spot like many other American cities. We saved thousands of lives, and we protected our healthcare system from collapse. This chart of new daily cases in the Oklahoma City Metro, so this includes Oklahoma, Canadian, and Cleveland counties. This, new, this chart of new daily cases in the OKC Metro from March 15th through May on a seven day rolling average illustrates that chapter of our pandemic story I just referenced. It is a textbook flattened curve. Keep in mind, it includes a full month of reopening and therefore illustrates that we proved for a month we were capable of flattening the curve even as we returned to activities we had set aside in March and April. And then came June. This chart illustrates the entire pandemic story through yesterday, including June. You can see that new cases in the OKC Metro have spiked in the last two weeks and now are averaging around 80 new cases per day. At our first peak at the beginning of April, we were only averaging around 50. This spike has happened in an environment where total tests administered have declined due to diminishing demand and where the percentage of people testing positive has increased. The only good news I can share about this chart is that it does appear in the last few days that things have maybe plateaued. But here's the unique twist that has caused this chapter to be different than the first chapter. Very few people are dying. Here is a chart of deaths in the OKC Metro for every week of the pandemic since its commencement. This chart reminds us all of the very grim reality we lived in through March and April. You can see it's, it's each week of the pandemic on the left and the number of people who passed away in our metro area on the right that week from COVID-19. Those sobering numbers from the height of the pandemic draw a significant contrast with the loss of life in recent weeks. We mourn every life lost to this virus and we send our deepest condolences to the families of those we have lost. But as you can see, the toll on our city has changed dramatically in recent weeks. The worst single week for deaths, April 5th through the 11th, saw three times more people die from COVID-19 than the last four weeks combined. Well, why is this? Rising cases and declining death seems counterintuitive. The story of COVID-19 as we know it is that people get sick and then some of them, too many of them, die. That was the story of the pandemic for its first several weeks. It was a primary reason we acted as we did. However, it is also a bit of a generalization. As the human race has learned more about this virus, we have come to believe that people of different ages experience it differently. And in fact, the recent spike in our total cases is almost completely driven by people between the ages of 18 and 50, a total departure from the demographic that was driving the first spike back in March and April. Though we don't yet know the long-term effects of the virus on younger people, 
it does seem that younger people do not seem to react to the virus as severely in the near term. This chart illustrates this current trend by depicting total cases confirmed since the beginning of the pandemic in three different age brackets. People under the age of 18 are in dark blue, that line you see at the bottom of your screen. People between the ages of 18 and 50 are the orange line that spikes to the top of your screen uh, at the far right. And people aged 50 and above is the bluish grayish line that is the, that as you can see, is at its highest point early on in the pandemic uh, on your left and then dips down below. We can see that the first spike in the pandemic was driven by people ages 50 and above. Then we can see in June the modest upticks for people under 18 and people over 50, but a tsunami of cases from people between the ages of 18 and 50. So no big deal then, huh? Well, not exactly. First of all, people between the ages of 18 and 50 do not live in some sort of bubble. They are the children and grandchildren of vulnerable people. They might be standing next to you at a wedding. They might be serving you a meal in a restaurant. They might be your mayor. And people between the ages of 18 and 50 are more likely than ever before to be carrying this virus in Oklahoma City and giving it to more vulnerable people. Second of all, what we are seeing in the case spike could be a precursor. Because in the last week, though we have not yet seen an increase in deaths, we have seen an increase in hospitalizations. On Wednesday of last week, there were 43 people hospitalized in the OKC Metro for COVID-19. But that number as of yesterday was 79. ICU patients moved up from 22 to 33 over that same span of time. These hospitalization numbers for the OKC Metro are right at their all-time highs for COVID-19. Keep in mind, we have never gotten close to overwhelming our healthcare system in OKC, but that's right where we want to stay. We are now in a zone where we need to pay very close attention each day to what is happening with hospitalizations. I am here today to share these trends with you so that we may all be on notice. I have always said we would follow science and data in our pandemic response, and we're taking this time today to walk you through the science and the data because this chapter presents some new twists, and we're trying to react accordingly. But if hospitalizations continue to rise at the rate seen over the last few days, or if deaths return to the rates seen previously, we will have little choice but to roll back to earlier phases of our reopening. This is a critical week, and we will be watching this data every day. As I said two months ago, when we moved into this new phase of our pandemic response, the process of returning to some normalcy was a dimmer, not a light switch. We are here today to say that if you have relaxed your own personal precautions in recent weeks, and let's face it, chances are you have, it is time to resume better habits. Dr. Patrick McGough is now going to share some information I think you will find helpful as you try to lessen your own risk profile and your own chance of catching or spreading COVID-19. Before he takes the stage, let me share my own advice. And it's the same as it's been for a long time. The virus would be stopped in its tracks if we would each do three things. Keep our distance, wash our hands, and wear our masks in public situations where social distancing is difficult. And I can't believe I have to say this, but if you are sick, please stay at home. We're here today for the first time in seven weeks to ask you to regain the mindset that worked so well for so long. If you think you're bored by the pandemic, how do you think we feel? But the virus hasn't gone anywhere. We can get through this safely with caution and common sense, 
but we can't let our guard completely down. We will live with this virus for many months, probably years, and we have to turn our precautions into habits. And did I mention wearing your mask? And now, Dr. Patrick McGough, our partner in this pandemic response, who has been an amazing one, the executive director of the Oklahoma City County Health Department. Dr. McGough. Thank you, Mayor Holt. We greatly appreciate you for lending your influence and your voice and your leadership passionately for the public's health. Thank you for the time and effort that you consistently spend with our team and for the public's greater good. Oklahoma County and Oklahoma City, thank you for your serious efforts and support as we have all endured the ongoing nightmare of COVID-19. Though ever cautious and evaluating, we committed to you seven weeks ago that we would sound an alarm if data began trending in a direction that became a cause for greater concern. Today, I want to talk specifically to our sons, daughters, family, friends, and neighbors who are 18 to 50 years old. My children are in your age group, so I know how amazing you are and what an incredible impact you can and are making on the world today. So please help me to get to your counterparts in our great city, our great state, our great county, to take this virus seriously. Due to the prior messaging focusing on the age 65 plus, you may look at the data and determine the virus isn't really about you or your social group and that there is no need for concern. But there is, as there are individuals in your age demographic who have died there are far less deaths than in any older demographic, but it does happen. What we know is that if a member of your age demographic contracts COVID-19, they may suffer briefly with little or no symptoms, but your mother, father, grandmother, or grandfather who you spread it to may not fare so well and may not survive. This is also the case if you have friends in your same age demographic who have one or more chronic health conditions. We know that being away from daily habits and friends was difficult the past three months, and many of you have picked up where you left off pre-COVID-19 became a part of your lives. You're living life to the fullest, resuming the activities that so many of us hold dear, including attending faith-based activities, indoor physical activities, bars, weddings, funerals, and other small private events. And this is a group that we are seriously deciding may need to be called the Serious Seven. Again, faith-based activities, indoor physical activities, bars, weddings, funerals, and other small private events. These are the events and activities that shape our daily lives and where memories are created. And yesterday, Mayor Holt and I had the opportunity of sitting down and interviewing very briefly one of our epidemiologists, Hermila Haile, and she was just sharing with us some of the true intimate details, and that's what we want you to hear today. No one's trying to discourage these events. What we simply want you to do is use the proper precautions as you participate in these events. So what's different today, however, is that these activities and events in the age of COVID-19 are showing up week after week as super spreader events. So we're also going to call these the seven super spreaders, where many individuals at the same event are exposed to the virus. These are not, obviously, scientific terms. I'm just trying to give you something to help you remember when you think, oh, there were seven of those. What were they? That's what we're doing. We're seeing it happen right here in Oklahoma City. You've heard by now how important contact tracing is to slowing the spread of the virus in our community. And we're learning during our tracing how these private events and personal activities are contributing to the fast spread of the virus in Oklahoma City and throughout Oklahoma County, especially in the particular age group of 18 to 50. I urge everyone who is 18 to 50 to be aware of the steps you can take to protect yourself should you choose to engage in these activities or attend similar private events. 
If you cannot remain six feet away from others or you can't wear a mask, you should not participate in the event or activity. Further, if you feel sick or have symptoms that feel like allergies that persist for a long period of time, you should probably refrain from attending activities and events and get tested as soon as possible. And that's basically based upon an inter the ongoing interviews that our epidemiologists are having with individuals is they keep hearing, especially in the age group 18 to 49, that people will say, well, I just thought I had a tickle in my throat. I thought I was having some problems with my allergies. So I'm trying to really just give you real life scenarios that are ongoing and what we're, we're seeing and experiencing. Additionally, you need to notify your employer of your symptoms and refrain from working until you receive a COVID-19 test result. We strongly encourage and urge employers to recognize the critical role you have in slowing the spread of the virus in our community. Employers should never force a sick employee to continue working, and yet we're hearing that is happening. This is a tremendous risk to the employee, their colleagues, and their business. Finally, if you make the choice to participate in activities or events that have the potential to be one of the super spreader locations, make sure you wear a mask. In these scenarios here in Oklahoma City where individuals have tested positive for COVID-19 and attended group activities or events, mask wearing is one of the biggest factors in determining who has to be quarantined once our contact tracing investigations begin. So again, when they start looking into who were you connected to, what event were you at, they're going to also ask, did you wear a mask? Was anyone else there wearing a mask? And that's going to determine largely who may or may not be quarantined. We've made it this far by working together with everyone doing their part to help mitigate the spread. But it's obvious that we've kind of gotten a little bit too loose However, keeping our economy open depends on each one of us. If you want to continue in this new normal that we have where we can make the choice to eat at a restaurant, shop at our favorite retailer, and return to our jobs, we must remain vigilant. Wash your hands, stay six feet away from others, and wear a mask. Recent research supports that wearing a mask protects both the individual wearing the mask and those uh, near them. Some folks are not aware of that new research. And so again, I want to say it protects you as well as others. For the longest time, we were saying, and it was very true, wear it because you care about others. But now we're saying it also protects you. It is not a political statement to wear a mask. It is not a political statement to not wear a mask. Wearing a mask is a statement that you value not just the lives of others, but that you value your own. I want to say one more time, please don't forget the serious seven, the seven spreaders. And we will be talking about that more. You can probably look to our OCCHD website after today and see some more information about that. Again, thank you for all that you have been doing to try to mitigate the spread, and thanks very much to the mayor and his team for their invaluable efforts and influence and in sharing public health information. Thank you. Okay, we'll take some questions from the media. We'll start with the general record. Star six to unmute yourself. There we go, okay. Um, is there any way to put the toothpaste back in the tube at this point? Like, what can actually be done to, uh, to fix this? Maybe more of a... Can you hear me? Janice, can you repeat your question, please? Well, um, just, it seems like the toothpaste is out of the tube. Like, are we just going to have to batten down and expect, um, you know, a, a big surge? Or is there anything that really can be done now to mitigate what's, what's happening? So um, this is Dr. Mack, and I want to say that I think that the mayor did a great job using the data and the information, kind of showing where we are. Um, what we are seeing is kind of a new normalization. 
And so, yes, we are saying for people to get serious. Um, this is a time to um, make certain that we don't just think, oh, wearing a mask is such a bother. Oh, I'm not going to care if I'm going to a small, intimate gathering at someone's home. We really need to think about those things and think clearly. And so I think that's what we're saying. This is a time we are sounding an alarm. We cannot keep going in this direction because, as Mayor said, we don't know if this age group, right now we're seeing an uptick in hospitalizations. We've seen an uptick in the number of cases in that age group. So we don't know what's going to happen in two or three weeks. We, don't, we haven't been seeing a lot of new deaths in that age group, but we don't know what's going to happen. And so also we can't just keep letting uh, a surge of people in the age group of 18 to 50 keep contracting and spreading the virus. So we're asking for that group to take action. The action is the same action it's always been, wear a mask, wash your hands, social distance, it's the same kind of information. But I think we've seen the transition from the 65 plus group that everybody seemed to be focused on at the beginning of COVID-19, and it's time that we look at a different age group because that's where we're seeing the uptick in cases. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Spots 25. So, Mayor, you mentioned that if the hospitalizations continue to rise and they continue to peak, you said that we'll go back to one of those phases. What, what is one of those phases, and does that include having to not only recommendation but a requirement to wear masks? Well, we never had a, you know, we have not yet had a so-called requirement, and I say so-called because there's no way to enforce that, and we've never had that in any of our previous phases. So I think we'll continue to, on the issue of masks, we're going to continue to message it. I'm going to continue to lead by example. Um, but to your, the other part of your question, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll look at what makes sense. I mean, we don't ever want to do anything um, that's irrelevant to halting the spread of the virus. So we're going to be talking to public health officials. We're going to be having those consultations with the epidemiologists like Dr. McGough just referenced, trying to figure out what prior restrictions from phases uh, you know, behind us might be useful to diminishing the spread. And so that's an ongoing conversation. Um, but you know, we, we, have to, we have to continue to monitor the data and, and see that it's, that it's justified. I mean, we always have to have a proportional response here. We have never at any stage of this pandemic response done anything just because you know we recognize there are enormous ramifications for the things that we do and so we try to we try to have a proportional response and so today i tried to lay out you know the data and illustrate how the deaths have so significantly declined um and 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 probably because the cases are largely in the 18 to 50 year old demographic having said that i also wanted you to know that the hospitalizations are increasing so as you alluded to if that continues to rise at the rate it has over the last week, we will be in a position where you'll, you know, the hospital administrators will be calling me saying that we've got to do something. I haven't gotten those calls yet because we are far from that point. Nobody in a hospital capacity has called me in the last week and said we got to do something because we're really just back to kind of where we were a couple months ago, which was still way below our capacity. So we still have room uh, to accommodate this, but not that much. I mean, we can't go on like this forever. And that's today is a bit of a, is a bit of a, shot, you know, a, a wake up call to remind everybody uh, of what's going on, that we're in a pandemic. And we certainly had always made the promise to talk to the people of Oklahoma City if the numbers were spiking. Some of the numbers are, not all of the numbers are. Uh, and so we're kind of in that zone right now where we just got to monitor this. And this could go one of two ways. And, and we'll be watching it very closely every day. Dylan with KOCO. Hey, Mayor, I have two for you, if that's okay. Um, the first being, just on Charday's question, you said, uh, you know, obviously we've never had a requirement for wearing masks. Is that off the table for you just because you feel like it wouldn't be enforceable or, or wouldn't be effective? And then the second one is on hospitalization, is there a particular level that that Dr. McGough or that you are, are saying, once you get to this level, that's when we'll be really concerned. Is there, is there other specific thresholds where, where we'll start to be concerned? Yeah, I mean, on masks, it, it, it's, 
I hear people say you should mandate that everyone wear a mask and as if that's actually a thing I can do. You know, we live in a free society. We have 650,000 residents in the city limits. Um, you know, personal responsibility is the only way to enforce actions like that. Um, and, and so we will just continue to message that you have to wear a mask for the safety of those around you. You know, I should have brought it today. There's that great picture of a whole audience at, at a football crowd in 1918 wearing masks, you know, and there's probably other pictures like that. That just happens to be the one that's made the rounds. And, and I keep thinking, you know, this, these thousands of fans at a football game in 1918 were probably not trying to make a political statement either way. They were probably just trying to use common sense and not get a virus. And that's all we're asking the people of Oklahoma City to do right now, um, is wear your mask to protect everybody around you. And in turn, they will wear their mask to protect you. And if we all did that, you know, you know statistics and data and, and research have shown that transmission of the virus will plummet. Um, I feel like you asked something else, though. What was the, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, hospitalization, JR. So, so I don't know like the number of our capacity off the top of my head, um, and I don't know that Dr. McGough does either. If he does, he's welcome to jump up here. But um, you know, we'll, we, those numbers exist, and you know, we're going to be looking at that. I don't know what the exact threshold is. We'll probably rely significantly on the counsel and guidance of hospital administrators, you know, to uh, to make those determinations. But I think it's fair to say right now we're nowhere close to that but we are moving in the wrong direction. And over the course of the past week, we've been moving in that direction rapidly. So if that same pace continued, it, it is assured that we'll be at those capacity points in the weeks ahead. But you know, that's why we're here. And we hope that we can um, halt that growth and get it back uh, to a manageable level. I mean, it's at a manageable level now. I should say keep it at a manageable level. So. I was going to speak just for a second to, uh, we have a statewide surge capacity plan for hospitals. And uh, so if, if it entered those thresholds, we would certainly be notified and would get involved in that process. And the mayor would as well. Um, we are not near those uh, surge levels. And uh, you know that involves things like uh, the critical care units, the number of respirators and all the things that we heard about months ago when uh, folks were worried about crashing uh, hospitals. Uh, hospitals. And so, uh, I mean, that's kind of all that, there is a statewide plan, there's a surge uh, capacity that we look at and it's across the state and the hospitals have done an excellent job uh, working on that to my understanding and uh, partners all the way from uh, Tulsa Health Department, the State Health Department, and then the Hospital Association. It's been great. And so uh, there are numbers and there are metrics for that. So thank you. KFOR. Uh, Mayor and, uh, and health officials as well, you talk about the uh, the seven. Can you, can you repeat the seven for me? And and Mayor, are those the first things that would be scaled back if uh, we start to go backwards on the reopening? So first, seven. yeah, I'm going to start with the seven, if I can even remember those without my paperwork. <laughs> uh, since that's not the mayor's idea, I didn't want to leave him out there hanging. Um, so we're talking about the, the faith-based uh, opportunities, those settings and activities, uh, the bars. We're talking about where people are uh, entering private groups, uh, settings for like funerals and memorials, weddings, small events like that. Uh, all of these have been uh, the key, and I don't know if I captured all of those. Someone's handing me some paperwork. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to uh, look at this and see. We talked about faith-based activities, indoor physical activities, bars, weddings, funerals, and other small private events, and that's how we came up with the seven. Um, the uh, indoor activities I want to talk a little bit about, we're not discouraging as a health department that people be active. We want and encourage people to continue to be active, especially during COVID-19. It's good for our mental well-being as much as our uh, physical well-being, but you have to participate in activities that allow you to social distance. And if people are like 
all grouped together very tightly, and that's what some of the reports that we've heard through these processes of interviewing clients is that they've been uh, exposed to some of those kinds of settings. And I was just trying to give you a clear picture of these are the things that are affecting the group that's 18 to 50. So that's my part. I'll let the mayor speak to the other. Yeah, and so if we felt like we needed to roll back, you know, I certainly am going to be asking questions to Dr. McGough and to the epidemiologists, you know, hey, in phase two, we had hairstylists wearing masks. Do we have a lot of cases where clients of hairstylists are getting the virus? And depending on the answer, you know, I want to tailor the, the remedy to the problem. And so we will certainly have those conversations. You know, you just heard him state that exercise classes, you know, spin classes are a little bit of a problem. We've seen them pop in some of the interviews that the epidemiologists are having um, with, with people who have contracted the virus. So, you know, gyms were an element uh, of previous uh, phases, and, and so that's something we would certainly talk about. But, you know, we want to be focused and we want to be surgical. I mean, there's no point in stopping things and stopping activities at this phase um, without, without justification and evidence. You know, <clears throat> at the very beginning of this pandemic, you know, we didn't have anything. I mean, we really had no evidence, and it was a very new virus, and we really had to go into it, you know, with a, with a bludgeon, you know, and now we've tried to be a little more surgical, I think, moving forward, and try to really stop the spread where it is happening. So absolutely, this, this evidence and all of this information that we've been able to gather over the last three months, you know, helps us uh, hopefully come up with more targeted uh, restrictions in the future if that is necessary. But if we can plateau here and we can keep the cases, you know, where they're at and begin to diminish them and begin to control, you know, the hospitalizations, then we don't have to do that. But this is a critical week, as I said earlier. We've got to see you know, this thing go one direction or the other. Can I add to that? Uh, I would like to also clarify that we have not seen a surge in the personal type care salons where people are getting their hair cut. That's not been an area of, of concern for us thus far. And so that's why it's not included. And we were just trying to bring you real transparent information about what the, the super spreaders were. And that's where they are. I mean, for all we know, this may change from time to time. And I would anticipate that the mayor and I will be back up here talking about where, what are the groups now? Because we don't want to lump everyone together. And I might want to say we get incredibly wonderful reports every day from uh, different restaurants and businesses that are doing things so well. I'm so impressed. And so it's really hard for us to lump uh, any group together because one gym is amazing and another gym may not be doing so well. So it's really complicated and we want to be very protective of businesses and individuals of their private health care information. And so as we put all this together and we worked on it as a team, we've worked on it with the epidemiologists, with the legal department, trying to figure out the best ways that we can convey in the most transparent way possible to the public. These are your issues. If we can work on these, we can take care of this. Non -doc. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I hope you can hear me. I can. Yeah, I uh, hope you're well. Uh, quick question, one week from today, Oklahomans will go to the polls and vote on state question 802, which would expand Medicaid coverage for low-income adults. Oklahoma, as you know, has the second highest uninsured rate in the nation with about one in seven folks lacking health insurance. We all know that our high uninsured rate strains our health care system because if an uninsured person is hospitalized with, say, COVID-19, the hospital has to write off the cost of that care as a loss. So you said earlier that, quote, nobody in a hospital capacity has called me in the last week and said, we've got to do something. My question is, has anybody in a hospital capacity asked you to vote in favor of SQ-802, and have you decided how you will vote? Uh, well, not like personally. I mean, I get emails, you know, that everybody else gets, and I'm aware that the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber has endorsed that state question. Our city has no official position, and I really feel like, you know, for the most part, I have to, I have to keep my public comments to the, the issues that our city has a position on, and we have not weighed in on that. 
uh, but the, I know that the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber, which I'm a part of in my capacity as mayor, has endorsed it, uh, and a lot of other organizations have, have as well. And certainly, I'm aware that hospital executives, I believe, in our metro are certainly for it. And I have, if I haven't received personal phone calls and don't feel like they have to call me, I have certainly received, uh, you know, their mass communications. And I, I do believe it is true that they are, they are supportive of that state question. And by the way, since you mentioned voting, I do want to endorse voting absentee, if at all possible. And I think today may even be the last day to request an absentee ballot. I'm getting some heads nodding on that. And I have voted already absentee. Well, you, you're a public figure. Do, do, have you decided, I mean, you said you voted absentee. Do you, do you personally uh, favor 802 or, or do you oppose it? Well, I think, I mean, honestly, I think that the mayor, and I'll be just very candid, I think the mayor shouldn't wade into every single issue um, that doesn't directly, you know, involve municipal government. And I mean, yeah, I voted 20 times on that ballot and I'm not gonna, you know, it's a secret ballot. I'm not gonna tell you every single person I voted for and every single issue I voted on. I will always advocate publicly and strongly on issues on which the city has a clear position. Um, but in this case, the city has not discussed or has a position on 802. And you know, I've shared you know, some of the entities here in the city that I value that uh, do have a position, and I certainly listen to them and respect them. But I think the mayor should pick his battles, and I'm, I'm always gonna be upfront about that. Thank you. Okay, C3 Press. Thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. <clears throat> Mayor, I want to I want to ask you. This is this is definitely a municipal concern here. It's about <clears throat> it's about city health codes. Um, <clears throat> and you know, um, most of the public saw circulated social media. <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, photo, photographs of one one particular bar on Cinco de Mayo in Midtown that was just jam packed. No real concern about anything like that. Uh, while their competitors uh, went to great expense to make sure that there was social distancing. Uh, so, you know, when it, when it comes to just bar ownership and, and, and you know, com competing in, that, in that, that, that whole environment, uniformity of application of health codes means, means a lot. I mean, it, it, it really affects the, bot the bottom line for the business. So my question to you is, um, uh, to what, to what extent will health codes be, be employed with, with particular kind of, kind of loaner bar owners out there uh, or restaurant owners that just decide uh, that, it, that it's really not important to do any of this stuff, it's not important to do any kind of social distancing at all, while their competitors are going to great expense to do that. Uh, to, what, to what extent uh, will, will health codes come in there uh, and, and will those health codes be applied uh, for the sake of public health uh, to, to owners who just simply decide, yeah, they don't, they don't want to go to all that trouble? Yeah. It's hard not to answer your question without getting pretty legalistic pretty fast, but what you're referring to in terms of social distancing and mask regulations have really been created outside of the democratic process. You know, what, when we have had restrictions, they have been declared under you know, the rubric of an emergency, and they have been declared by the mayor, and they are by nature temporary, um, and, and they are by nature only really enforceable by the entity that has declared them, therefore the Oklahoma City Police Department. Health codes, are, you know, the, the things that OCCHD typically enforces, you know, people wearing hairnets, people washing their hands, you know, making sure there's no roaches or rats in the kitchen, those are based on existing laws that went through the democratic process and are permanent, unless they are repealed. So I don't know really, and, and I'll turn it over to Dr. McGough here in a moment, I don't know that they really have existing health codes that reflect pandemic response. And maybe that's a conversation to have as this pandemic continues to stretch on into months and maybe years. But right now, the only things that we've directly had to enforce, been able to enforce related to the pandemic, are these emergency rules that his people aren't even really empowered legally to enforce. Um, they are more coming in from the city level or the state level. Dr. McGough, any thoughts on that? Thank you. 
Uh, so certainly, and what we use to uh, govern and, and assist the restaurants with and different entities like that, those have not changed. And so those are the same even during this pandemic. And uh, so I appreciate that question. It's a great question. We still have the same uh, surveyors that are going around looking at the restaurants and they're still working with the owners and the management to make th sure that things are safe for the public and trying to help in any way that they can. And those are outside of these other elements that Mayor has been talking about. Thank you both. Have I missed anyone on the call who would like to ask a question? Okay, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, be well, wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your distance. Bye-bye.